Uh, good morning, everybody. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, and I, I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Chair. Director Palacios? Uh, here. Bernal? Here. Montoya is currently absent. Goldstein? Here. Bauman is currently absent. Harvey? Here. Long? Here. Espinoza is absent. Vice Chair Corpus? He's running about 10 minutes late. Okay. And Chair Mendez? Here. Uh, so, uh, moving on, no, this is uh, not the time to take public comment on consent agenda um, or regular agenda, wait until the consent calendar is called, but I'm actually merely asking, are there any changes to the agenda at this point? Okay, moving on. Uh, now, public comment. The public may provide comments on any item not on the agenda but the board may not take any action at this meeting at any item not listed on the agenda other than then refer the matter to staff or set it for a future meeting. Any member of the public wishes to address the board? Okay, C9, thank you. Um, board member may announce, the, is there any board member that might need to recuse themselves from any particular item on the agenda? All right, moving along. Um, Presentation overview of MBCP exploratory energy programs. It's an information Thank you, Mr. item. Chairman, Mr. I, Chair? I've got uh, Beth Trinkard as well as uh, Mark Buckman. They're going to be uh, making that presentation for you. Thank you. Welcome. Um, I know normally when I'm presenting for you folks, it's about formation of the Community Advisory Council. Well, we're very close. We're hopeful that in June our um, Community Advisory Council members will be appointed. So now the shift of staff is focusing on how do we best support the Community Advisory Council. We're assuming that once the Advisory Council is seated and they've worked through some of their administrative um, responsibilities, one of their first focuses will be on how to best invest back into the community through our energy programs. So what we'd like to do is share with you kind of our first blush at what we're considering. We'd like to present the advisory group with a preliminary list of energy programs that we're expecting them to review, edit, revise, change, get community input, and ultimately prioritize those programs and present them back to the board. Um, just to kind of set some expectations around timing, again, we're assuming the Community Advisory Council will be formed in June. Um, they're going to have to do various administrative tasks such as um, define their bylaws, define their scope, um, they'll be trained on the Brown Act, we'll offer some background on uti the utility industry. So the assumption is that by August um, they'll probably begin reviewing programs. Um, after several months the hope is that by November and December they'll be able to review with the Operations and Policy Board. That would give staff time to begin to um, define the program design with an implementation by March. Um, oh, my apologies. Sure. Go ahead. <laughs> and so just to give a brief overview of what this presentation will cover, we'll start with a market review of existing programs at CCAs, as well as uh, California municipal utilities. And then we'll go over what are the different overall program categories that we can look at. And intermixed with that, we'll look at, well, what are the sort of exploratory ideas for potential Monterey Bay Community Power portfolio of programs? So to start off with, um, reviewing the existing CCAs that are um, currently operational in California, and we look at the different types of programs that they're working in. This is just to give a very high level overview of what are other CCAs doing, where are they investing their time and resources. And one of the things to point out is that where CCAs are really putting a lot of focus is on electric vehicle infrastructure, charging, as well as electric vehicle incentives. Um, they're also doing um, some direct procurement of solar and other resources through feed-in tariffs and other mechanisms. And they're also looking at uh, enabling different technologies that they deploy in their service territories to be controlled, aggregated, and then dispatched as demand response programs as well. So there's, that's what we call grid optimization. 
looking at the broader spectrum of municipal utilities, you see a, a decent amount of overlap with where the CCAs are looking. Uh, a lot of focus on EV charging, a lot of some focus on EV incentives. Um, so what we would expect there's there's a, that's really the the obvious um, next subject for to to tackle programmatically. And then this next slide, I wanted to just highlight kind of historically. Um, a little bit of a snapshot of the different programs. Most of the municipal utilities at some point offered a customer solar photovoltaic incentive. The vast majority of those programs have been successfully completed. They fulfilled the original mandate, they fulfilled the quota of systems and money that they were looking to expend, and they have now closed those programs and in some cases also met their net energy metering cap and switched to a feed-in tariff or other mechanism. So the takeaway from this, I think, is really that incentives directly for customer photovoltaics and solar, that has kind of um, been passed, and we've kind of moved on now to where we're incentivizing the next technologies, EV charging, EV, um, and potentially looking at battery storage and other technologies on the grid. Actually, I'll take that one. Oh, okay. Um, so that's kind of the high-level market view as we look at programs, which helps define. Obviously, we need to keep into consideration both our JPA goals as well as our customer goals. Um, what we're doing is we're working with those goals. We're working with um, the community input we've already received. We're also working with technical advisors to help us evaluate programs, again, all with the goal of pulling together a, a list for our community advisory council. We also understand um, that while we can start with our goals to define the programs, we're assuming that the Community Advisory Council will also be creating a, an analytical framework, if you will, to really define criteria to define the programs. Um, obviously, again, our, our goals will help define it, but there are various elements uh, that need to be evaluated as well. Um, this is an example criteria of what uh, marine, marine Clean Energy uses. Um, they, they categorize it based on what their customer and community benefits are, excuse me, their environmental benefits as well as their agency benefits. Um, I don't mean to be prescriptive, this is just one example. There's a lot of different ways of prioritizing um, amongst the different program options. And to just give an example, um, it's very possible that if our community advisory group was to decide to invest heavily in local development, that's a little more costly than other options, that would have to come from something else, whether it's lower rebates back, there's, there's a trade-off. And that priority, that criteria would have to be defined again by our advisory group. Um, this is, um, I know you've seen this slide before, it's really just a summary of three years of revenue and then expenses for Monterey Bay Community Power. I just want to highlight that first row, which is the programs, to just set some context. Um, this year, we have budgeted $3 million for programs. If that's not used, that will roll over into the following year, making that $8 million, and then the year following, $22 million. And again, just to provide some kind of context, Sonoma Clean Power um, had a, uh, what I think is considered a very successful EV charging station program. It ran for three and a half months, and they had budgeted $2.3 million. So as you look at the program dollars we have available, that's just to give you some sense of context of, of how far it'll go. Um, and this is another slide that I know you're all very familiar with, but I think it uh, bears kind of repeating. We know based on the AMBAG greenhouse gas emissions um, study that 42% of our um, greenhouse gas inventories come from transportation. Um, and then, obviously, the other large chunks coming from commercial and residential. If you were to just look at the commercial, industrial, and residential and kind of double-click on those categories, what you'll find is about 60% of our inventories come from natural gas emissions, 40% comes from electricity emissions. And we know that once Monterey Bay Community Power has launched, those electricity emissions are going to fall to pretty much zero. So our focus, the takeaway from this, is our focus needs to be on the transportation sector as well as um, getting rid of that natural gas use. Um, really what we're trying to say, and we want to make sure everyone understands, is we're going through this exercise 
to create a list of programs for the community advisory group to use as a starting point. We don't mean to be prescriptive, we're not defining these programs, but it seems that it would be valuable for the community advisory group to start with at least a draft of programs that have been evaluated. We'll have technical advisor support to show the outcomes. It, it's just a starting point. So again, based on the, uh, the trends within our industry, based on our own agency and customer goals, based on where our greenhouse gas emission inventories appear to be, these three categories seem to fall out. One is transportation electrification. One is looking at building electrification and efficiencies. That's truly looking at the existing building stock and moving from natural gas appliances to electricity appliances. And then local energy resources, which addresses the needs that we've heard um, and that are part of our, our agency goals, which is to have local control and resiliency. So just to spend a little bit more time on what is transportation electrification, you know, it, it's a spectrum. Today, there's lots of successful programs around individual EV ownership and, and home-based charging stations. But as you move out towards that spectrum, it's not quite so easy. Um, when you look at commercial fleets, there's some successful programs. As you get more and further out and you look at things like electric diesel, or excuse me, electric um, school buses, transit buses, delivery vehicles, those are much harder. There are successful programs out there and I see a lot of opportunity in those areas, but they're gonna be one-offs. There's gonna be finding the exact right situation learning from it and having success and augmenting one at a time. We're just not at that place yet where we can um, offer a broad program like we can with <clears throat> individual EVUs. Um, to spend a little bit more time on that too, I want to make sure that, that we all understand that in terms of today's EV use, 80% of the population charges at home. So that means that anybody who doesn't have access to an outlet, a garage, who lives in an apartment, townhouse complex, what have you, doesn't have easy access to charging an EV. There are some sites, some work sites that offer um, charging stations, but it's a rarity rather than common. So one of the things that we really need to focus on is how do we ensure that we get charging stations at multi-unit dwellings? how do we go about getting more worksite charging stations so that we can really open this up to um, a greater population other than those folks who just have access at their homes. Yep. So when we look at the individual, within the transportation electrification, if we look at specific programs we could have, we definitely want to look at new and leased, <coughs> new and leased EV um, incentives. Again, Sonoma has a very popular one running now. We know it's successful. Um, we really want to focus on the used market. All the forecasts show that this is supposed to be the first truly bumper year in the used EV market. Um, unlike traditional um, fuel-powered cars, most owners, whoop, most owners purchase 50% lease for 50% owned. That's in the in the fuel driven car world, it's more like 80% owned, 20% leased. So the expectation coming from that is not only of where there'll be great supply in the used um, market, it, the prices will also be much lower because of the incredible incentives that those new owners purchased up front. So there's a lot of opportunity, there's expected to be a lot of opportunity that would actually allow us to bring some of those prices down below um, a gas powered car. So we really have an opportunity for our disadvantaged community, potentially for fleets, and for the rest of the, the community who's not really quite willing to take a chance on a new EV, but if they can get a used EV pretty affordably, they might take a jump. We um, also know that, um, I think Dr. West is here, um, she provided some fabulous resources that discussed um, the possibility of perhaps if we took the tri-counties and we negotiated with um, the OEM, the car manufacturers, potentially some dealers, we could get a discount off sticker and focus on that for the new um, and leased vehicles and then put all of our energy into used. That's a possibility. The other thing that um, I think we need to consider that, that Tom raised is when you invest in EVs, potentially those customers can change, they can move out of our county, right? If we invest in charging stations, th those are assets that stay within our community. 
So we would like to put a focus on charging stations. We know that home charging stations, and there's a difference between level two home and level two commercial grade charging stations. The home charging stations, um, lots of successful programs, um, again, Sonoma actually gave away a level two charging station. The customer just paid for tax and shipping. So lots of opportunity to go to the commercial grade charging stations for work sites, for um, multi-unit dwelling, that's a lot more difficult. There are examples of success, but it's not a scalable program yet. It's gonna be another um, situation where we know we have lots of work sites who would love to have charging stations at their work site, but they can't afford them. So we need to figure out who best to reach, who will meet the most of our customer needs, and start um, approaching it that way. Um, electrification and efficiency. Again, this is um, truly looking at how do we get, and I'll start with residential, how do we get residential customers to move their, their natural gas um, water heater to an electric water heater? Um, it's not, there are many programs out there today. I don't think there are any successful ones. <laughs> There's a lot of um, white papers that are floating about around how to crack this market. A lot of people are trying to crack this market. But there are specific barriers that um, we need to go after. In particular, um, I don't know if you're familiar with on-bill financing. Um, it's a financing mechanism for residents. It's kind of similar to PACE in that you would actually pay for it through your utility bill. And the value of that is the bill stays with the meter. So as renters come and go, as owners come and go, the cost of that electric water heater stays with the building. And there's a lot of advantages to that. Um, there's also an issue around um, the incremental installation costs. It can be extremely expensive, depending on the setup in your house, to get um, uh, electricity run to your, your hot water. So there's that issue to address. It's a complex buying decision. It can be. I mean, not a lot of people are familiar with it. Um, so there needs to be support available to people who are considering it. There needs to be availability through our contractors. They need to be educated. So again, all those, all those barriers need to be addressed. None of them overwhelming. I know that um, Sonoma Clean Power and uh, Silicon Valley Clean Energy are working very hard now on how to crack the nut on on-bill financing. So we're all kind of moving together forward, trying to figure this one out. Um, so this will happen. It's just, um, again, it's initially, I don't think it's gonna be a large program. It's gonna be one-offs as we figure out how to, how to work through it. Uh, cool. Go oh. ahead. No, that's fine. Okay. And so finally, the last sort of larger category of programs that you know, in some ways may cover the broadest scope is local energy resources. And there's different technologies, and there's also different ways to approach it. So looking at it programmatically, there's an existing rebate available called SOMA for solar on multi-unit uh, affordable housing. We should really evaluate that existing program and see where we can supplement it, fill in gaps, um, make sure that it works for as many of our customers in our, our service territory as possible. Um, and that's the follow-up program to the MASH. Um, this one is a little bit more focused on making sure the benefits flow to the actual tenants. Um, we can also look at just funding work being done right now by Grid Alternatives, which is a really great um, nonprofit. They have a local office here in, I believe, Salinas, and they also have a really significant job training component to what they do. And they are, um, you know, for lack of better words, they are a uh, solar version of Habitat for Humanity, where they. Um, install solar on low-income homes. And they do a lot of tremendous work, and finding out how best to partner with them and maybe build on the work they're already doing is a great approach that the Community Advisory Council should definitely analyze. And then finally, looking at where storage fits into um, different resources that you know, we would like to incentivize and install in our service territory. There will be changes to time of use next year. Um, there will be different opportunities for demand response and other uses of this technology. So it's definitely going to be an area where, again, the Community Advisory Council should really be evaluating it and, and thinking about it as we look at our different programs that we can implement. And then a different approach is through direct procurement. So a lot of CCAs, a lot of municipal utilities are doing direct procurement through a solar feed-in tariff program where they're buying the output from projects installed in their service territory. Again, this is a way that we could look at approaching storage. 
And then microgrids, which is a admittedly pretty nebulous term right now, you'll hear it thrown around a lot in different use cases. Um, probably not something that we should immediately try to jump on, but definitely something that we should look at um, tactically and think about how we might want to approach it in the coming years. Where is there a real value for it within our community? Um, and then lastly, this is a 100 percent local service uh, local solar service offering. So we received approval to offer MB Prime, which is a 100% renewable option. What other CCAs and a few local municipal utilities have done is actually, you know, uh, procure solar through a feed-in tariff mechanism and then sell the output from that solar to customers directly through a 100% local solar service offering. So that's another opportunity and another type of program that we can look at and uh, evaluate with the Community Advisory Council. And so what is a, a potential portfolio of programs? What could it look like within this um, category? We could have a feed-in tariff to do local procurement for solar. We can offer some of that through a 100% local solar service offering. We can uh, support or extend or at least even just advertise the SOMA program, so as many qualifying um, properties within our territory take advantage of it. On the commercial storage, um, we should really look at demand charge reduction as an opportunity here. It's probably the most consistent um, customer request on the non-residential side um, across multiple different categories, including a lot of uh, public um, works departments within JPA members. Um, so really looking at that as a potential program offering. Um, and then also, where's there opportunities for microgrids to extend electric service to the cannabis industry that's having difficulty getting interconnected in various areas, and then where can we deploy it strategically to maybe help solve some grid congestion issues that are affecting certain areas within our service territory. So that is a, a very short review of a very broad category, um, three broad categories, and hopefully we've done a, a decent job of just giving an idea of the landscape, some of the challenges. Um, and some of the opportunities that we can look at. But as you can see, there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of fun work to be done with the Community Advisory Council in evaluating these different offerings. So thank you. Thank you. Um, any comments or questions from the board on the presentation? <coughs> Mr. Harvey? There we go. All, uh, it seems a little bit of like all things to all people, and it's just a large number of programs. And what I'm worried about is maybe making a little bit of progress on a whole bunch of programs versus prioritizing. I know that's what we're asking the CAC, I guess, to do, but I worry also about them receiving that and having to. That's a lot to wade through. Uh, um, great stuff. I just think that when maybe should be distilled a little bit. That's a lot to digest. Okay. Thank you. We just wanted to offer you the width of all the programs available out there. Uh, we're not promoting any of them. Uh, we're not supporting any of them at this point. Eventually, we have to evaluate all of them in terms of benefit-cost analysis and uh, what kind of tonnage of greenhouse gas reduction that they will eventually lead to, and then select the finer few that we will be implementing. Okay. Mr. Goldstein. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Th this uh, probably relates to ben Ben's comment as well. <clears throat> when we looked at the uh, JPA goals at the very front end, um, you know, I think it, it sort of goes without saying to some degree, but it wasn't listed there that our goal, one of our, you know, those are some of the explicit goals, but at a top level, we need to provide elect stable electricity source to our customers compliant with CPUC and all other regulatory uh, requirements. and. I, I mean, I think I don't want to minimize the work that we've done so far because so much of it has been focused on that. Um, and so, you know, kind of overarching over all this, you know, it, it, it seems to me that we would need to make sure that that, that remains there, that look, we got to be able to provide the power that people need in a stable way, compliant with the regulations. And then uh, I, I just jumped out at me when I saw that, the goal slot. Yeah, we, we uh, are always got that in the back of our minds. The first two goals are reduction of greenhouse gas and offering rates that are competitive. Those goals are always going to be the top two for us. Uh, the programs is to deal with um, local local jobs, local uh, and additional reduction in greenhouse gas, of course. Okay. Any other comments from the board? Any comments from the audience, member of the public? Okay, great. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. 
Uh, moving on to the consent agenda, uh, that those are items six through nine. Are, is, are there any member, any board members who wish to pull any items? Great. Hearing none, is there a member of the public that would like to address any of the items in the consent agenda? Okay, great. Um, I'll entertain a motion for the consent agenda. So moved. Second. I move by Mr. Goldstein, second Mr. Corpus. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Uh, moving on to the general, general business portion of our agenda, the uh, CEO report. Mr. Kabashi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I want to introduce the, um, the new employee. We got only one. Uh, Kevin, where is he? Will you stand up, please? There you go. Um, Welcome. Kevin, Kevin Miller is uh, our power supply analyst, uh, recent graduate uh, from uh, University of um, uh, California in, in Humboldt County. Um, great addition. I've, I've known him for about a year now because we did hire him at uh, in a different place as an intern, uh, and, I, and I'm really glad that he decided to come here and work with us. Um, second, I want to... Uh, report on this some discussions we've been having with uh, Pacific Gas and Electric uh, about uh, maybe six weeks ago maybe uh, it's maybe six to eight weeks ago they have uh, PG&E that is decided that they would like if they can reassign all the contracts that the, all the PPAs with the project participation agreement that they have signed into that have a life cycle of 10 years or more they wanted to assign all those contracts, and uh, there was a grand total of about eight different contracts that they wanted to reassign. Um, and they, uh, they asked if we can make an offer. We, uh, the time frame that they gave us was very short, so we told them that we are interested, but we, don't, uh, we cannot give you an offer, uh, at least on one project that we are looking at. And that project specifically is in, uh, in the county of Monterey. And it's a fairly large project, and we obviously said we need to have that discussion first with our boards uh, before we make an offer. Um, <coughs> they didn't seem to have a problem with that. They even said you can go ahead and we can start preliminary talks. We're not reaching any final agreements until uh, you we eventually get your approval of it. So I just wanted to uh, raise that flag to let you know that we will begin discussion with the Pacific Gas and Electric on reassignment of a contract that they already signed into back in 2014, I believe, uh, for a, I believe, 150 megawatt uh, um, project. Uh, and um, the understanding, the way this would work is when we do the contract with them, they reassign the project to us with all the rights and obligations, then they will pay us the difference between the offer that we're going to make to them and the contract price to bring the contract price which is obviously right now is fairly high relative to what's available in the marketplace so that will be the arrangement that will be done in order to bring the contract price into a manageable um, uh, uh, price and again the project is in monterey county i'm sure that all of you will be very supportive of having a local project fairly large one uh, if we can uh, if we can manage to make it um, so we're going to start that discussion very soon and um, market outreach update, we started already um, sending uh, notifications to our residential customers. The first notification is out, and there's a copy of it in, uh, in a packet. Yeah, check it out if you, if you like and give us any comments that you, that you have. That, uh, that took into account all the input that you've given us uh, in the last uh, couple of months. And... Um, there will be another <laughs> notification going out next month. We are already receiving phone calls and, uh, and a lot of uh, emails coming from residential customers trying to figure out what Monterey Bay Community Power is all about. And, and uh, Shelly is doing a fantastic job dealing with all of it. And, um, and um, next that I wanted to, um, uh, by the way, also the opt-outs, we are now roughly at about uh, three percent of the total uh, commercial customers the ones that already are in our service territory all the customers but residential and when I say three percent it's by demand not by number of customers number of customers is 
considerably less than 1%, I believe. Uh, yeah, about maybe one third of 1%, but the total demand uh, of the ones that did opt out is almost up to 3%. We are trying as hard as we possibly can uh, to bring some of them back. And I'd, I, I wanna acknowledge here, um, uh, Lou, he's been working with us, with a couple of customers at least, to try to uh, convince him that uh, it's in their, in their best interest to, to work with us. Thanks very much, appreciate it, Lou. Um, last, uh, last is um, a quick discussion about, that's okay, I, sh I think I'll do this, I'll do this one. We, uh, I think we already heard that we, we are receiving applications for the Community Advisory Council. Uh, about 60 applications um, are received. We are putting a summary of them together. We'll have all the applications and the attachments and the summary all go into the three uh, member committee made up of the three supervisors from the three counties. Um, and we're gonna be meeting with them. Uh, we're gonna try to schedule a meeting on the 9th of the 10th of May uh, to uh, present them with all the names and, um, and have them uh, select uh, 11 of the of the 60 applicants eventually to uh, nominate those 11 to the policy board during the meeting on June 6. And what else do we have? <laughs> Next one. Or what, w with that, well, I'll conclude my remarks and, and see if you have any questions. Any questions from the board? Okay. Any member of the public? Okay. Oh, um, yes. We have looked at um, at uh, having a remote place, and uh, I believe Tiffany has a report for us, or is it Steve? Um, we have um, performed the feasibility study of the remote location, and um, so far we visited four places in Santa Cruz, and then the potential place would be the Santa Cruz City Planning Office, because they do have all the equipment that we need, and then they also be able to provide an IT person there to help us to set up the web conference going at the beginning. Uh, however, we do want to let the board know uh, some of the potential challenges. The first thing is um, the tech presentation PC over here in the boardroom will no longer be used, be able to be used um, because that PC will be busy with the web conference. We need to add another PC for presentation purposes. And then the other challenge that we will have um, will be the delay when conversing from site to site across the internet, especially during the live streaming. And then the next challenge that we will have is someone, we, we will need the additional manpower at the remote site to sh ensure proper Brown Act compliance. For example, an agenda must be posted at all the uh, location at the 72 hours in advance. And um, also the meeting must comply all other aspects with the Brown Act and in all respects be the same as a meeting where the members are physically present and at least a quorum of the members of the legislative body must participate from within the body's jurisdictions. And then also all votes taken during the uh, meeting must be by roll call. And then um, the location must be accessible to the public, um, including the disabled. And then um, also the meeting must be conducted in the manner that protects the statutory and constitutional rights. Do you, do you have any questions? I, I just want to comment that, mm -hmm. the, uh, given the, the list that you just heard, we definitely prefer that we have everybody here and instead of having a remote co remote location. I understand fully um, th that the need for some of the folks in Santa Cruz to um, to be able to have a, a different location if they so choose. Just remember, it's only eight meetings a year, folks. So. Uh, to the extent that you can have it here will make uh, uh, everybody's life a little easier, but if you do want to have a remote access or, or a remote location, uh, by all means, to the extent that we um, abide by all the requirements that Tiffany just shared with us. Great. Well, I'm looking to this side of the... Uh, <laughs> any comments? 
Yeah, I would, I would encourage uh, us to pursue this. Um, I don't think, um, I think for our residents, it's an important issue. And I think, you know, one of the issues when uh, the board uh, decided to move to Monterey, um, as opposed to Salinas or somewhere in mid, or Watsonville, which I viewed as more mid, midway, uh, this is really a long way for people from the city of Santa Cruz to come or, you know, the, that are part of the town. This is a big uh, effort for the community and for um, and for some of the board members. So I, I, I really think it's an important um, gesture from the board to, to offer that availability for the public and for, and then the other thing is that I think for us, it's a, potentially at times it's a full, it turns into a full morning or longer, like today it could be, it ends up being pretty much more than half a day for us. You know, we'll get back at two or two thirty, and uh, to the office. And so, um, I think the we've done this before. It's not that. I mean, there's issues, but they're not unsolvable. I mean, they're you know, we've done them before. Uh, there's Santa Cruz has a, a city clerk that can easily post it, and um, we can. Uh, we'll have to just see coordinate among ourselves who will be there, but th and the board members. But from uh, at least from my perspective, I think it's a, at least it's an alternative. I think uh, we may not want to. I think occasionally we'll want to come to the meetings here because I just for the physical presence. But telecommuting and tele, you know, um, conferencing, video conferencing is just the wave of the future. I think it's more and more with traffic, and it's also a green thing, right? If we're uh, this is actually a very green uh, uh, gesture on part of the board, as opposed to people driving all the way here too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Or you can get an electric car. Yeah, but I took the hybrid. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's worth at least trying and uh, you know seeing if it, it works out. I think you're right that at times uh, having um, the the physical presence uh, makes a difference, and so maybe, maybe if we can look ahead at agenda items too, they might help determine it too. I think pr particularly for, you know, if there's some really critical items where you really need to have a lot of discussion, maybe that's maybe we make an exception there. So maybe looking ahead at meetings and agenda items and trying to, to sort of provide a balance might be helpful. And, and if you're all comfortable with the idea of uh, Santa, the city of Santa Cruz being the venue, then yeah. we will put together some sort of a procedure or process to follow in order to make the contact with you folks to see if you want to set up that look remote location for this or that meeting and go from there. Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, doing it, oh, I'm sorry, Jamie. I think um, the idea of doing it, um, ahead of planning ahead of time and deciding which meetings we want to do that, I, I'm not thinking that we do it every meeting, but I think we do look at it strategically and have some meetings where we, where we do plan them to be remote. I would echo the comments of my fellow board members. I, I would also suggest maybe that we try in sort of a low stress um, environment first. Maybe the community, um, the I'm, from, I'm blanking on the name, the CAC Community Advisory Committee, uh, potentially is kind of the first rollout, so we don't end up rolling it out for the first time on a contentious item with you know 50 people in Santa Cruz and 50 people here and and just difficulties with the coordination. So. I'd say give it a shot. It's not necessarily my number one priority, but I do agree with the comments about you know better accessibility for our residents in the Santa Cruz region. Mr. Chairman, do we require an action? Uh, I guess uh, because I we put it right here in the, in the CEO report, we didn't think it, it needs an action. Yeah, just direction should be fine, okay. I think, right? It should be agendized for the next meeting. If okay. You have a vote on it, but uh, it can't be voted on at this meeting. Yeah, I know, but I think you're getting general consensus, at least from the board, that worth exploring. Exploring it and developing it further. Sure, we'll do it. Okay, any member of the public uh, wishing to address the board on the consent items? I mean on the consent items on the CEO's report. Okay, great. Oh, go ahead. Hi, Seth Capron from San Benito County. I just had a quick question. Uh, functionally, will the people who are remote be visible on the screen for the mm -hmm. audience at both locations? And are you just talking about one remote location in Santa Cruz? Yes, we would really appreciate it if we don't have any more than one remote. Yeah, it just doubles up the, the, the work that we need to do in order to make sure that the, the meeting is well organized. So yeah, we're talking only about one remote location. 
Yeah, okay. one's reasonable, and, and I think the way it's set up, you can, the camera looks at the whole table, so yes. you can uh, Yeah, everybody will, yeah, will be visual. Yes. Okay. okay, great. So we'll bring you back to the next, our next meeting. Okay, moving on to item number 11, uh, approve the replacement of MPC general counsel contract position with a full-time employee position. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, uh, one of the things that we'd like to do, are you okay? Okay. Uh, it, uh, so far in the last um, um, seven, eight months, we've been operating with the idea that we have our legal counsel is a contract position, and uh, Angela is here representing us very ably. Um, we also use other attorneys, some on the regulatory side, and we work cl very closely with the California CCA uh, to do that. And we are sort of free riding on a lot of uh, their um, expertise in the other CCAs, whether that to be um, Sonoma or um, uh, MCE or, or Silicon Valley or, or Peninsula. All of them have in-house uh, lawyers actually helping uh, quite a bit on the regulatory side. And finally, we use outside attorneys in order to help us on the contra on the PPAs, the, the project participation agreement, the large contracts that we are negotiating uh, with the negotiated already or the ones that we are currently negotiating. Um, and with the addition of the CAC and having two boards, uh, I'm getting the feeling that I really need to have some support uh, um, of an in-house counsel if we can help it. There are three options av available to us. Um, one is to just have uh, hire an employee that will, re will be an in-house general counsel and, and allow that uh, individual to go and, uh, 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 and sign letters of engagement with other attorneys as they see fit if the need arise. Uh, a second option would be to do what we do now, continue with the, with the same approach. Um, uh, a third option would be to go to one of the counties that have already a lot of folks that are offering to uh, sign contracts with, uh, with them so we can use some of their lawyers or one of their lawyers that can come over here and, and spend 20, 30, whatever number of hours with us on a weekly basis and do that on a contractual um, uh, arrangement. Um, I think I would like to open the door to examine these options and see which one we wanna, we wanna follow. So my suggestion is that we would approve uh, uh, allowing us to go out and look for a general counsel um, and that when we go out with the, with the request or the posting, we allow for folks to say, well, we have a different offer for you. We, have a, we want to do it on a contractual basis or we want to do it uh, on a service that we can get from the county basis and just tell us what they are willing to offer and for how much. Then perhaps uh, bring uh, folks from the policy board, from the operations board to do the interviews and look at the, all the different options that are being made available and pick the one that, that will be most effective and most efficient for us. Um, Obviously, I can't do that at the current arrangement because the, the acknowledged position that we have is a general contractor, um, and that leaves us only with one option. If we can expand it a little bit so I can open the door a little bit and see what's out there and what we can get uh, for the money that we are willing to pay, uh, that would be uh, uh, most appreciated. So I'm bringing it to you first uh, with the intent uh, to the extent that you, you agree. I will take it to the policy board in June, uh, and if they agree with it, they will put together um, a request for offers, so to speak, from uh, from various uh, folks, whether that to be to come in and work on a full-time basis or to work with us on a contractual basis and go from there. Thank you. Any comments or questions from the board? Mr. Goldstein? Do you have an estimate, um, Mr. Avashi, of currently what the billing rate has been on a weekly basis? Like, the, not billing rate, the billing, billable hours, um, what we're looking at right now? For the, for the general counsel, uh, we've been running uh, somewhere between 11 and 13. <coughs> Did I get that right, roughly? Yes. Between 11 and 13 uh, grand, of 14, 11 and 14 a month. Uh, but that doesn't count any work that's being done on the regulatory side or the, the work that's being done on, um, on uh, 
PPA uh, negotiations. Uh, that is total so far, I think. Uh, our estimate from October to March, we probably uh, are in 180 thousand, so to speak, on legal fees and services. Did I get that right, Stephanie? All right, about 180,000 so far that we spend in the last uh, six months. So, so let me try to summarize. Do you anticipate that to be the sort of the going rate moving forward, or do you anticipate the, the workload to ramp up as uh, operations I grow? think it may ramp up with the, with the, when we begin uh, working on programs and when we bring the, 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 the advisory uh, council. I think we're probably going to be spending a little bit more. So I'm going to do some math here, which is probably a mistake to try to do from the dais here. But <clears throat> you're talking about $180,000 approximately over six months in sort of outside counsel, not general counsel. So annualized, that would be 360 plus general counsel, which is uh, sounds like the burn rate is about uh, 144 no, a year. I'm, I'm saying total on legal uh, support that we got, whether it's general counsel or the outside counsel that we're getting for the power supply negotiations. All of it is coming at about 180. Oh, okay, so the all-in figure right now for the last six months was about annualized would have been about 360. You anticipate that figure rising um, over time? Yes. Okay. Okay, so that's kind of the break, break-even point, as it were. Uh, uh, and and I didn't talk about the the um, the work that we get in, on the regulatory side. That that is extensive, and right now we're just free free riding on other CCAs, um, I, I would like us to be a little bit more involved. Uh, free riding is all well and good, but again, when you free ride, you just go where the bus takes you, uh, not where you want to take it. So we need to have a say in what goes on in regulatory agencies, and we can't have that without having our in-house counsel. Uh, Tom, what's the experience of the other CCAs? Uh, are they mainly in-house counsel? And they, uh, some have it, some don't. Most of the smaller ones don't uh, for obvious reasons. Um, uh, the larger one tends to have it. I think there are about two or three of them that have their own legal counsel at this point. Have you looked at In-house the counsel. MCE, for example, have several. Yeah, yeah. They have the legal counsel with about four people mm -hmm. reporting to her. So I, I assume it's a difficult position to recruit for in-house. Uh, to be honest, no. Uh, no? <laughs> I, uh, at least just by s putting, out, putting out the word, uh, at least I have a couple of contacts that said that they would be interested. Um, whether they are the best or not, that's a different story. I think what I would like to do is just open the door a little bit and allow for options, then uh, working with uh, both the operations board and the policy board, uh, pick the best option, which may very well be what we have now. You know, that may very well be the approach you want to continue with. I just want to have that option compete for our business. Thank you. Mr. Long? So the, the concern that I would have is if you bring it inside council, that you still may be spending several hundred thousand a year for the expertise of, of, um, of specialized type projects, and, and then it gets become very expensive. And th that's the problem is if you have a full time, is your intent to have that full-time pretty much do all that work, or are you still going to have to contract with outside legal counsel? I think the range that we put in place is uh, something like 180 to about 280 something, which is midway between what uh, Silicon Valley and what MCE offer uh, to their general counsel. Um, whether we're going to bring somebody, I don't think we're going to bring somebody at the top level. Yeah. But if we find s if we find somebody that's just to have the yeah, absolutely fabulous expertise about everything, then we may pay that kind of money. Um, is it <coughs> less or more than um, than what we are doing now? I I can't, to be honest, tell because it may be it, it is two different services. Um, one you continuously have to con go out and ask for something and you get the answer, yeah, maybe immediately, maybe not. Um, the other one is with in-house. If you have a question, you can get the answer right there and then. It's just two different type of structures. Uh, not to say that I'm in favor of one or the other. I just want to get the best. But, but do you think an in-house would be able to meet all your legal needs? That, that's no. the question. No, no, absolutely not. They, they will probably 
Uh, if they're really good at negotiating power supply agreements, they're going to need some help on uh, general counsel uh, meeting uh, uh, etiquettes and, and uh, Brown Act and, and the rest of it. If they're really good at the, at the city work, if we get somebody from the county, for example, they will be probably perfect when it comes to general counsel work, but they will need help on um, uh, when it comes to negotiating uh, projects and uh, and contracts. So I would assume that uh, if we bring in somebody on the inside, they'll still need a little bit of help on the outside. Mr. Palacios? I guess I'd also point out that even if you um, do have an in-house uh, general counsel, they can also be on contract. Uh, they don't have to be a full employee of the organization. Uh, for years, I've had, when I was city manager, I had both. I, at different times, I had a city attorney who was an employee. At other times, uh, I had a contract who was my general counsel, and they just had office hours. You know, I just had them. And, and so it gave you, I, I actually, in the end, uh, favored more the, the contract because it gave me more flexibility in terms of using different uh, attorneys. But it, it is possible to have somebody as a general counsel who's a contract employee that you would have have them set office hours and be available to you and it's just something that I'm not saying that should be the way that you go I think you should just be open to it as we look into the options uh, it's precisely what uh, the county of Monterey is offering and and definitely I want to consider that as, w as one of the options Mr. Bernal I was going to say uh, I had the same experience but it sounds like what you're uh, suggesting is being open to you need a dedicated person and then Precisely the best way to sort of set it up. It can can be either an employee or a contract with our person. And I've had the same experience. I've worked for multiple cities, and in one city in Mountain View, for example, it was in house. And in Santa Cruz, we have a contracted. Uh, but it's I r there's really no difference because they're dedicated. They're they're there. They're just as effective. Uh, it's just a matter of, of having that dedicated service and uh, finding the right individual. And so whether it's a contract or in house could. Both could work. So looking at both is a good idea, I think. Mr. Bauman? So rather than debate the pros and cons, I would recommend that we support Tom's uh, recommendation, go out for an RFP to, ex to solicit um, legal services either in-house um, and compare that with contract and potentially public agencies. Okay, so before I do that, can I, uh, is there any, any member of the public wishes to address the board on this item? Hi, my name is Emily Fisher. Uh, I know it's it's suspicious when an attorney shows up to talk about why you should hire attorneys. <laughs> uh, I recently started a, a solo law practice focusing on public agency law and specifically CCAs. I was uh, legal counsel, one of the legal, legal counsels with MCE before this, and uh, I think this is a great thing to explore. Um, in my experience, the Having someone in-house is a huge value add in that staff has nearly unlimited access to that person. They can be a really engaged strategic team member of the agency, not just somebody that gets called in when, when there's a problem. Um, and they should also be able to manage those outside council relationships effectively and economically with you know the commercial interests of, of the agency in mind so I think it's a good way to bring those costs down as well um, I am making a tour of CCAs around the state to try to figure out how I can be useful and uh, I'm definitely available to support Monterey Bay in any way that uh, you may need during this process and the ex exploring the, these options and uh, providing backup for Angela uh, with any issues that can come up. I do have, I do specialize in public agency ed, uh, ethics laws, um, some contracts as well. Um, it sounds like you'll be needing training for your uh, advisory committee, and I do the it's some very engaging, uh, almost fun Brown Act trainings. <laughs> <laughs> I, w I, I don't want to. You know, overstate it, but uh, that that is something that I would love to to offer to to your staff and and your boards and committees. So, thank you for letting me take this three minutes to <laughs> to introduce myself, and I wish you all the best with this process. And thanks for, for the good work you're doing. 
Thank you, the member of the public. Okay, bringing it back. I think we had a motion from Mr. Bob and a second, Mr. Corpus. Any further discussion? Mr. Chair, um, w one, one point, maybe it goes without saying, is, is that I understand under the JPA rules that the, the policy board hires um, general counsel. That, that's the way the, the JPA is written. Um, under the JPA rules, the, the, the position of CEO is very clearly identified that this board plays a role in helping to identify <clears throat> the candidates and nominate candidates for the policy board to hire. And I would just like to, whether it's a friendly amendment or just see if there's a board concurrence that I think uh, this board has a lot of experience in hiring uh, department head, high level employees, and certainly would offer our assistance and try to be engaged in this process um, to help you, Tom, identify the candidate for the policy board. So just just one point I wanted to make. Okay. Concur? Second? All right. All right. Um, do I have, uh, what's the pleasure of the board? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Great. Thank you. Moving on to item number, where am I? Number 12. Um, authorize CEO to execute an EEI master power purchase and sales agreement and confirmation letters with Calpi Energy Services LP with effective dates of March 9, 2018 for the purchase of resource adequacy capacity for 2019 to through 2023. Yeah, good morning, uh, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, board members. I just wanted to quickly discuss why we're asking for the uh, execution of the master agreement and the co uh, confirms. Uh, it is a, a regulatory obligation that Monterey Bay Community Power meet 115% of peak load uh, through resource adequacy for reliability reasons. So for, uh, because of this, we went to the market and solicited uh, many offers from, from different counterparties. In the end, uh, we selected uh, Calpine Energy Services for a portion of our system requirements as well as our local requirements. And uh, through staff consultants, um, we negotiated contracts um, and, and the pricing, and that's what was delivered in the board package uh, today. So with that, we have the EEI master agreement as well as the four confirms. Two of them are uh, two-year uh, confirms that uh, for system RA that meet about 50% of uh, our needs. And then the other two confirms are for a uh, five-year local RA that meet about 90% of, of our needs. So um, staff is just recommending today that uh, the board authorize the CEO to execute both the master agreement and the four confirms with, uh, with Calpine so we can uh, move forward with the procurement process. By the way, this is Jerry Clark. Thank you. Great. Uh, any questions or comments on the board? Mr. Corpus? Yeah, just can you refresh me on how that 115% is uh, calculated and why it's at 115 on, on the peak load month? Uh, yeah, so the, the 115 is actually set by um, the regulator, uh, regulatory body. We have to meet 15% over our peak load, and it's calculated on a month-to-month -month basis. Um, we send load forecast information to the CEC who in return uh, reports to us our obligations. So it can be adjusted every month or so? Um, Your peak load varies, the, 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 right? The peak load varies month to month, and there's two adjustment periods per year that we can submit new load information okay. into the CEC. And what time of the year are those? July um, is the first one, and then um, I think February is the uh, second time frame. Thank you, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. uh, Director Goldstein? I'm sure that this is a more complicated question than it probably um, I really want to ask, but can you succinctly explain the difference between resource adequacy and then actually power purchase agreements? <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, power purchase agreements are, are for our energy needs. Um, and resource adequacy is for grid reliability. If there's a contingency, um, if a, 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 a plant trips offline somewhere in the system, everyone needs to make sure that they can pick up the slack. And that's what the 15% uh, over our 100% energy needs is for. Um, and it's it just to make sure to ensure that there's uh, less chances for blackouts, brownouts, or any other reliability issues. 
any, one any other, other? this is at the other end of the spectrum uh, just on the, the the actual attachment to this document i see a, a lot of information about contact information for um for our organization as well as for the the uh, calpine energy and there's a scam that's been going around um and many of you see uh, the member cities here have experienced it where our finance directors will get directives that appear to come from the chief executive officer for the city issue you know directing our finance officers to issue a money order to some vendor that may be a legit vendor but it isn't the right bank account so uh, maybe as a suggestion in the future is, is a little bit less information on these cover sheets about sort of actual names and contacts because that just can give somebody what may appear to be an even more legit scam by including names and addresses of things that they could they could find here so just as a minor suggestion okay Director Bauman. so is calpine um do they have renewable energy sources or this would be a methane product in an emergency um, the uh, source, I would have to check the sources on that, uh, but they, they have a, a mix of um, generation resources, geothermal and natural gas and other resources as well. Yeah, not, the resource adequacy is never, well, not necessarily a renewable resource. They, any resource that's available in the system, because we're not buying any energy, we're not asking for them to generate anything. We're just basically saying, we need to make sure that you have this power plant in place and we're going to pay, pay you a bunch of money just to make sure that we have that resource available in case the state has to call on it. Okay, any member, any member of the public wishing to address the board on this item? Okay, seeing none, uh, what is the pleasure of the board? To move approval of the recommendation. We move by Mr. Bernal, second Mr. Palacio. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 You know, if I just, uh, I think uh, it's a clever suggestion to redact any information that isn't necessarily critical for the board's decision on this matter. Okay, so motion carried. Uh, moving on to item number 13, um, authorize CEO to issue a request for orders for local renewable generation and energy storage projects between one to three megawatts. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just in a way of introduction, I'm gonna ask James uh, James Mark is, is going to be introducing this item. I, I, since I got here, I've been visited with uh, quite a few developers that would like us to uh, put something, uh, to put generation, uh, more specifically solar generation, uh, in our service territory. Uh, I've also been contacted and talked to quite a few large customers that have projects that they would like us to engage with them on uh, that has to do with put in one to two megawatt solar generation. Uh, this is something that I know the community wants, the policy board wants, and um, and uh, I think we are in a position now to do something like this for a number of reasons, um, the least of which is that the price for these solar generation have gone considerably down in the last uh, few months. And so we, um, we're gonna go out and issue this RFO, and I'm gonna ask James to start talking about it. James. Good morning. Good morning. The recommendation is to authorize the CEO to issue a request for offer for local renewable generation and storage. The power delivery terms are five to 20 years. The capacity, as Tom mentioned, one to three megawatts per project with a portfolio target of 20 megawatts. In order to meet the requirements established by SB 350, MBCP issued an RFO in late 2017. The RFO required developers to propose renewable projects with a minimum capacity of 20 megawatts. MBCP received 87 unique responses and only one for a project located within MBCP's service territory. After the solicitation process, the staff noticed that Tri-County developers did not respond due to the requirements of the original RFO. In order to give local developers a better opportunity, MBCP created the accompanying Go Local RFO with different requirements, primarily generation capacity being smaller, one to three megawatts, a storage component, and resource location. The facility must be physically located and interconnected 
within any member jurisdiction of MBCP's service territory. We've met with customers, local developers, and determined that issuing the Go Local RFO will provi provide MBCP with a better opportunity to contract locally and provide a platform for developers to propose projects that meet MBCP's founding principles of local choice, clean energy, and economic vitality. The staff will consider the following criteria when determining the best proposals interconnection and capacity improvements, project location, technology, size and term, job creation, local hiring and prevailing wage, economic growth, increase in local investment, environmental impact, development or developer experience and project status. The fiscal impact of this RFO will be determined once MBCP truly receives responses. Uh, we will have price discovery at that time and better understand what technologies our communities wish to utilize. Staff has identified a potential annual premium of up to 3 million for 20 megawatts of local generation. So in conclusion, staff recommends that the board review and authorize the CEO to issue the Go Local RFO. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments? Or questions on the board? Director Bauman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Tom, would it be prudent to at least indicate to the respondents the, the relative scoring between the criteria? Because um, I, I think it's a great list. It's just it, it, it wouldn't be clear to me what would be the most important aspects of my response. I, I think if, if we... Um, if we do that, we probably bind ourselves. I'd, uh, I, I would like to think about it a little bit, Lou, to see if um, if it's been done that way by anybody. Uh, s sometimes when you really start putting percentages next to um, um, qualitative criteria, th you could end up in trouble because people will question it. Then you have to explain that. And so if you would allow me to think about it, I would like to think about it. Director Palacios. Uh, could you explain the sentence uh, where, you, where it says staff has identified a potential annual premium of up to $3 million for 20 megawatts of local generation? Can you just explain what that means? To I can, sure, I can explain that. It, it's generally identifying the difference between what you can buy, what you, what you can buy in the wholesale market, the solar generation that you can buy in the wholesale market, and right now it's running about a little less than two cents uh, kilowatt hour at our our um, service territory, uh, and the additional monies that you would have to pay a contractor uh, for that generation, uh, where the going market is for for a small, yeah, one to three megawatt, uh, and that probably is running. It was about maybe eight cents last year. It, a lot of them are now seeing the, that this is not going to be workable, so they're bringing it down quite a bit. Uh, I'm seeing numbers in the four and a half to five cents. That's still relative to wholesale market is expensive. So basically, what we are saying is the the value of l placing these resources locally, we may have to pay for it a little bit more than what we would pay in the wholesale market, and that dollar figure for a 20 megawatt uh, of solar resources will be about $3 million. But that, again, this is more of a, here's what I think it, it may look like, allow people to compete. It, the better prices that we get, hopefully we'll be able to bring that price down quite a bit. And Director Lane? Yeah, so m my question is really kind of following up on that a little bit, because on your criteria to rate the people, it's nothing about really the cost of providing energy to our consumer. Um, and I recall a year ago you said we would not be able to do local because it was so cheap buying you know, power elsewhere. So is that a criteria that we're going to look at is, is what we think they will actually be able to generate power locally so at least we can have that comparison? Uh, we can put a criteria that basically would say that uh, any uh, price that we're going to pay for local generation will always be lower than the average retail price. And I think, I think if we do that, then we're going to be fine. Uh, we will find a lot of local generation 
that will offer um, that will offer generation at lower than retail. Um, how much lower? That's really the question. Uh, right now, if you buy from the wholesale market, it's really low. Uh, this one could be lower, but obviously not as low as what you can get in the wholesale market. But I, I, I see your point, and we can put a number. Uh, we can put a line in there that says, you know, don't bid anything that would be higher than this number because that's our average retail price. When you say average retail, you mean average retail for purchasing solar. No, or average just retail. Yeah, average retail. Average retail rate. So basically, if our average retail rate, so. which is running probably today, I would say about seven cents. Uh, this is just a very rough estimate. So basically, we'll just have to say that you, if you have something that you want to offer that's more than seven cents, don't bother. And then the assumption is, even though you can buy solar, say two cents. Um, that's going to be not a criteria at all that you look at. You're just going to be looking at I, building I, local. I don't see a possibility that uh, any local supplier that will build one to two megawatt solar systems will be able to offer it at less than what I can get from the wholesale market today. I just don't see that as a, it's a zero possibility uh, uh, as far as I can tell. Director uh, Building off what uh, um, Board member Long just mentioned. I, I will note that in the attachment for evaluation of responses, the first, the second one is price. The second criteria, not in the staff report, but in the actual RFO, is price and relative value within MBC's supply portfolio. portfolio. So the RFO does identify price as one of the criteria. Um, a secondary idea, and I'm not sure, that, I'm, I'm fully supportive of this moving forward, but maybe something to think about going forward down the road is that we budget this. And by budget this, essentially, my suggestion would be that we identify a specific line item in the premium, you know, in our overall budget that we say, look, we're willing to allocate, you know, an additional five million to support, or three million or whatever the figure is, to support the local projects. Um, so that if the local projects come in, let's just say they're great, they come in at three and a half cents, that, that we budgeted a certain chunk and that, that can go further or if they all come in at seven cents or six and a half, um, it goes less far. But but rather than sort of an open-ended ticket, we end up saying, okay, here's how much we've allocated for this priority. Just as a suggestion, I'm not I'm fully supportive of moving forward with this now, though. I, I think you 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 certainly hitting on on uh, what we are trying to do, which is I look at the premium that we have to pay over and above what we could pay in the wholesale market as a program, effectively. It's just a program to support local generation and therefore the dollars or that premium eventually when these projects are built which i would assume probably two or three years <laughs> from now when they are, yeah they manage to get them all developed and and ready to go uh, any premium that we're going to pay for that if that's three million dollars for example that would be taken out of and here i'm making really a big assumption the 22 million dollars that we have we will have available for the programs so it is there's a finite amount of dollars that we can set aside uh, in order to um, to deal with uh, with local generation or the additional amount of money that we have to pay in order to buy locally okay uh, I have a comment I under first of all very supportive of this and I understand um, pricing and getting the best mo getting the best price and cost but I think I'm just sort of banging at this this has to be more than just that. It has to bring other benefits. So I don't know how we bring it into the RFO or RFP or RFQ, but I get it that we have to take from here to support this. But if this is generating some significant other benefits that are beyond just low-cost energy, we need to figure out a way to capture that, whether it's jobs, whether it's promoting uh, education, uh, training. There has to be a w We have to be more than just let's get the cheapest energy. Because then we're like other CCAs, and to me that's the low-hanging fruit. Uh, so I, I, I'm supportive of this. I'm not too sure I know what to suggest yet, but I think we have to be more than just about getting the cheapest price. I think our communities, I think our people, want to see other benefits. Um, and I, I know we know that, and I, I, don't, I don't know how we bring that into this. Well, Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, with the, the benefits are all outlined very carefully in the criteria that we are talking about. We are talking about uh, local developers. We're talking about um, uh, 
uh, project labor agreement. We are talking about uh, there's a fairly long list of of things that we are including in the criteria price being one. Uh, I, I don't want to discount uh, all that uh, that's included in the criteria. One of the things that we are including in the criteria, for example, if some if, if an entity or a, or a place where people want to put in generation because they cannot connect for the time being to, um, uh, to PG&E, then, um, then they, they want to see if we can put in generation in, in their forum. That's going to cost a little bit more, but that is one of the criteria that I, found that I believe is more important than, than most. If a customer wants to locate, they can't do it because they can't connect to PG&E, then definitely we want, to, we want to be there to put in generation for them to get them going, uh, even though it may cost more. And that is definitely part of the criteria that we are listing here. Uh, w the price is not 100%. It doesn't, going back to l loose point, are you putting percentage on each one of those criteria points? I, I haven't, but maybe I should, and, and if we do, Price is not going to be definitely 100%. It would be probably, uh, who knows, 10, 20%. Then the rest of the other points on the criteria will have also uh, a way uh, to, uh, to acknowledge them. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe one suggestion as an addition to the evaluate, uh, another criteria to add to your evaluation responses that's in the RFO, uh, to, to get at Chairman Mendez's point, um, made it maybe just innovative. How is the idea innovative? You know, some sort of points for innovation, right? Um, so we, ha we have, you know, it lists out price, it lists out location, it lists out local hiring, um, qualifications, experience, environmental impacts, a lot of, I think, of our core values. But I think being innovative is also um, a core value. Well, I think it's a core value for some of us, and maybe that is another thing that you could include to signal to folks that, that uh, we would like to see different sorts of ideas as a yeah, suggestion. Most certainly we can add it. And, and I just want to go back to the point that Chairman Mendes is, was making. We're not just looking at the, uh, the price. We're just trying to figure out how we're going to fund any additional monies that we're going to we're going to spend on this. Uh, that's the only reason we're looking at where do we get that money. And, uh, and I'm just saying the source really should be where the program's money is at, because if we spend a little bit here, then we spend a little less there. And just that we always have to keep that in mind. It's a, there's a lot of competing interests, and as a uh, we are as the staff and, and you are as the board need to be thinking carefully about where are we going to take it out of and give it to. Understood. Thank you. Sure. I remember the public wishing to address the board on this item. Hi, my name is John Doyle with Victory Energy. I am a developer. I'm actually not from here, but uh, uh, I came in to support this this RFP, um, the reason is, is my strength is more in financing, and uh, I would finance a project and think through all of the engineering uh, if I knew there was an RFO and I knew there was an offtake and a potential buyer. And some of the projects that I would, would think through um, would also uh, lower your resource adequacy or, or lower your overall um, power needs and help some of the potential load lower in your area. Now granted, this is definitely uh, local energy is definitely uh, uh, a little more expensive. There's a premium, whether it's land or labor, um, the closer you get to the, the load, the more expensive it is. And I imagine that uh, the labor is going to be a little more expensive here. Uh, but But there are um, other incentives and tariffs and, and, and um, aspects of a project that someone like me would think through and finance, but I wouldn't do that unless I knew that there was a system in place or an RFO or there were a potential offtake. So some of that financial engineering and wizardry, I wouldn't go through all of that unless I knew that there were a program. So. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, Andrew Hoffman here with Calcom Solar. Thanks good for morning. the opportunity to do public comment. 
Just wanted to, um, I work with Calcom Solar. We are a California developer uh, and EPC company and just wanted to give strong support for the uh, idea of doing local projects. We've built about five megawatts. are in the process of building a couple storage projects in NBCP territory. These are behind the meter projects, so they wouldn't be, they, these, what you're talking about now would be, I think, front of meter. Um, but customers really want this. I, mean, I think people see it as core to the formation of the CCA. Um, so we've had customers ask us, well, what is MBCP going to be doing on local procurement? You know, we'd like to do a project. So I just really think that this is a good opportunity. Um, and any way that we can understand as a developer community how it's valuable to you also, for example, storage and reducing redu resource adequacy requirements or places where the grid is congested and projects would be more valuable for you all or communities where you'd like to support local economic development. Those are all opportunities. Um, I was actually just hearing last week that um, the ISO has canceled numerous transmission projects in California due to local renewables coming in place to the tune of, I think, uh, I, I'm not remembering the exact number, I think it was over $2 billion in savings on transmission level in the state due to local renewables. So it's not just a benefit to NBCP, but we can actually save the state money by putting ro renewables here. And they do cost more than putting something out in eastern Kern County. Um, but local economic development, local transmission constraints, keeping money in local communities, I think it's a really good thing. Um, and customers are asking us, saying, when are, when are um, programs going to become available? So I think this is great. I also think a feed-in tariff is great, and that provides certainty for customers as well. I don't think they're mutually exclusive, so we'd love to see um, you know, both of those opportunities move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, Brennan Jensen with Emerging Ecologies, and I also just want to echo my support for uh, this RFO. I'm really pleased to see the agency take this step um, in prioritizing local uh, generation. Um, it's definitely very important from a from a core um, uh, core values position for the agency. So I'm glad to see this actualized. Um, just a couple comments. Um, so uh, what I see in this RFO is a, t is a total target of, in terms of the portfolio, of 20 megawatts. Um, that does still feel a little low. It may be appropriate for this first year, but we would love to see that continue to increase over time, as that still represents just a very small portion of the overall portfolio. Um, I also see that the, d that the target in terms of megawatts is limited to one to three megawatts. The prior uh, RFP that was released started at a minimum of 20 megawatts. So what we have is a gap currently between three megawatts and 20 megawatts. And so um, I'd like the agency to consider how we might try to support development um, or being able to capture the existing resources that are already here within our Tri-County community that are between three and 20. Um, we have at least a couple existing resources that are here in our local community that are in that range of three, five, up to 10, and I know that there's interest in folks potentially doing investment um, within that range where we could start to increase it. Um, one of the important elements within this space is also looking at base load power. We have several landfill facilities within our region that are generating landfill gas to energy, um, which is a renewable and base load, so it's available all hours of the day. It's a way of kind of handling that storage issue. Um, I'd love to see maybe some specification in the criteria or some preference points um, to look at that base load component. Um, and then um, just in response to uh, some of the comments of the directors, I want to support uh, Director Mendez's uh, comments around the importance of not just looking at the low cost. Um, so it sounds like there was some discussion about potentially putting a requirement um, that the price be lower than the average retail rate, and I would recommend that this RFO not be constrained by that. Um, I think it's appropriate to look at cost as one of the factors, but certainly as has been suggested by various folks, um, we can expect some higher rates locally, and as a local agency, I think we should be willing to pay that additional um, premium to be able to support that build out. Um, finally, a little small nuance I noticed um, on the local preferencing, which I really support from an from a, um, employment perspective. I'll be quick on this. Um, it, it looks like the employment has to be within the county 
where the generation is happening, and we, we may want to open that up just a touch so that it's within the tri-county area, as we know we have a lot of people who communi commute from one community within our tri-county area to another. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin Dayton representing Clear Honest Options and Clean Energy. Um, first, uh, as part of the idea of having uh, clear, honest options, I think it's very important to uh, indicate uh, within the material that Monterey Bay Community Power provides uh, what the cost is of this. There's a lot of pressure to say all of our electricity should be generated locally with solar. And I, I heard it mentioned, well, it costs a little bit more. But I also heard uh, that the in the wholesale market is a little less than two cents per kilowatt hour, and we're talking here about uh, seven cents per kilowatt hours. That's not a little bit; that's almost quadruple. And I think that the public needs to be aware as they they say, "Well, why aren't we doing all of our electricity locally with the solar?" That it, it's pointed out that this is a lot more expensive, and that the reality is uh, at this time you still have to compete against PG&E for rates. So uh, uh, let the people know why this is going on. I'll also bring up another issue. I heard the Magic Furries Project Labor Agreement mentioned, and I certainly hope that that is not included uh, within the bid specifications for this. It would be interesting to hear what Victory Energy and Cam Cal Cam Cam Solar says about the requirement to sign a project labor agreement. And if some people are, th when you bring up local hire and prevailing wage, which, uh, you know, prevailing wage, you have to do it anyway, it's in state law. If you're planning to do a project labor agreement, come out with it and say, I want a project labor agreement. I want to see both the operations board and the policy board have a vote on it so that people can talk about it. Don't slip it into things. Stop using euphemisms. If you're gonna do it, you're gonna do it. And uh, we need to have a vote on it. It needs to be open to the people that this is what the plan is. So I, both of those things, it's all about transparency, government openness, letting people know how much things will cost, and letting you know who's going to be getting favoritism in the bidding process. Thank you. Hi, it's, it's great news that um, Tom has determined that we can afford to do this now. It's really exciting. I was just curious if we could get a little bit of information about how the decision was made to limit this to three um, megawatts as opposed to maybe looking at some larger projects and which may or may not be desirable um, there certainly are some advantages to smaller projects um, but that could be another criteria for selection is the size of the project and I wonder if maybe you could give us a little input about the the difference in cost for a larger local project because um, certainly the, the cost per kilowatt is going to come down on those also thank you just quickly to address this question uh, the uh, one we needed to limit the total megawatts it, to something reasonable at least to begin with uh, but we also been visited with a couple of people that said I'll put in 20 megawatts or 30 megawatts well that gives uh, the entire deal to only one developer locating the project in one area uh, in one of the counties and I don't think that's what you folks want I think what I've heard from several of you, as well as a lot of customers, that they would like to have something put everywhere. They would like to have these projects spread around a little bit. And that's, what, that's the idea behind limiting the size of the project from one to three megawatt. Uh, I think that's a reasonable uh, number. A lot of the, the developers that talked to us, they were talking about the two megawatt level as a comfortable one for them. Uh, to the extent that we get Ten systems spread throughout the three counties. I'd, I'll be, and I believe you will be, uh, happy with it. If we end up saying there's no limit whatsoever to the upper size of the project, then we could end up having all 20 megawatts based on price and a variety of other criteria that we have established. Uh, we could end up with all 20 megawatts be put only in a single place. Great, thanks. Bringing it back to the board. So I'd move staff recommendation realizing that uh, there's a whole spectrum of public comments. I think they're all good points, but I think this is um, for this very early phase in this program that this is a good um, 
mix of uh, at least getting out, out of the gate and, and fostering local development without jeopardizing the fundamental financial integrity of this business model. Great. I'll second that, but I have a question. I move, uh, it's been second by Mr. Mr. Corpus. So the generation has to be within the Tri-County. Uh, does the ownership have to be in the Tri-County? Um, I, I would assume if you own it and if it's located in the county, then uh, are you saying that the person who owns it uh, need to be living in the Tri-County? Or the, or the corporation that owns it or operate it? Yeah, I, I would think that's the preference. Uh, I mean, if you have somebody from Idaho that's owning it and it's generating local. We run into this all the time with public works bids. People open up offices and they're part of a larger effort. And... Uh, and they open up an office for two or three years and they qualify for the percentage, the local preference. So I'm just wondering if, if it's really truly local, are we saying local ownership as well as locally generated? I, I mean, you tell me because you guys are the ones that yeah. know the, the market here and what might be yeah, it, reasonable. It wasn't yeah, it wasn't my my intent to have the the corporation that will actually build it and own it uh, be uh, be also uh, incorporated locally, because that may really restrict the opportunity quite a bit. Most of the corporations that I'm talking to you uh, in various cities, they're not here. They they just not incorporating in this area. Uh, most of let's face it, if the intent is to keep the money here. Just be aware that 60% or 65% of the total cost of the project is in uh, in uh, panels, and those panels are manufactured in the manufacturing of the panels, and that uh, those panels come from 95% of them come from Southeast Asia. Um, so that there goes a good portion of your. I, of I, your un funds. I understand that. I just think uh, the message to the public means, you know, that we're accepting. Gen locally generated uh, power within the tri county so you may get that question it's just one that comes up regularly at least in my experience if, if i may suggest ray that's a good point and I, I would imagine that will come up with a policy board um, would this board consider that we um, direct tom to incorporate the definition of local as codified in our local preference ordinances. There's a very clear definition, and I th it's probably the same amongst our jurisdictions, and we just incorporate that into this um, request for offers. You made the motion. I think that's, I, that would be acceptable, and, and then you could make your assessment on you know, whether that is really working uh, with this process. Would it be possible just to put it in one of the criteria that we will give preference to uh, local generation and local corporations? Yes, but I suggest that you, you follow the language of the local preference ordinance because it's clear and um, that is a, a big issue for our boards and councils. And so I, you know, we have it in our purchasing in Monterey County. I imagine you guys have it. I'm sure you have the same. Yeah, there's, uh, there are severe uh, legal constraints about the ability to do that. There's, you know, the, you can't do that. You can't, you can provide a preference, which is what we've done locally and that's allowed, but you can't exclude people because then you, then you're violating the constitution and there's all sorts of legal problems. But I agree that we've already vetted our preference, local preference. And what it does is it just gives, um, a potential local prep it gives a local preference points based on certain criteria and it complies with the legal the legal issues and so if you just added it to your criteria I think that would be fine that would be workable yes I was just gonna say but they may vary s somewhat so yeah. you'll have to sort of look at them yeah. uh, we have a motion on the on the floor with that amendment so just to clarify, so it'd just be a, another criteria. Another criteria point, that, right. That would be part of the evaluation process, right? Okay. All right, uh, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great, moving on to item, our next item, which is board member reports and comments. Uh, uh, this is an opportunity for the board members to report on an issue since the last meeting. 
Okay. We ha we have not. I think uh, we're moving on to our next. We're adjourning to our next operation boards meeting. Am I forgetting something? Just a couple of n announcements. Uh, just want to let the board remind the board we have photographs we need to take as well. There is lunch in our break room uh, for the board members. So following that, following your photograph, you can go grab some lunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.